morning. Today begins uh, a series of meetings, of presentations. The second part will be this afternoon at 3 o'clock, and then part three will be tomorrow at 7 p.m. and every weekday evening at 7 p.m. Now, notice the word series. A series indicates that Meetings like this are not a potluck. Uh, you show up, you know, oh, I think I'll go to that one. I don't know, I'm stay home tonight. I won't go. To They're connected. And in order to get a clearer understanding of what this is all about, you need to do your best to attend each presentation. Even if you think, oh, I've heard that before. Those are often the things where we need to refresh our memory. So we're going to begin with a word of prayer. Lord, as we start this series during this worship hour, we are going to be looking at your word. We pray, Father, that our minds would be opened, our eyes and ears would be opened to understand and see the interconnectedness that you have given to us in this treasure. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible, which is our title for this first meeting, it is the word of Almighty God around the world. Millions, billions of people have found it to be such. And if indeed it is the word of God, then it uh, needs to be able to survive a lot of different things. Number one, it has to survive the attack of time. It has to survive the irreverent scoffers. It has to survive debates, it has to survive doubts, and it has to survive endless attacks. And we find that is exactly what the Bible has done for thousands of years, and it is still with us today. God himself has protected his word. There is no other book like the Bible. It continues to be the world's best-selling book every year. And I checked earlier this year, and sure enough, 2016, the Bible was the best-selling book worldwide. In a world that seems to be moving further and further away from God, and away from faith, and deeper and deeper into chaos, the Bible is still the best-selling book. But it does us no good if we don't open the pages and study it to discover the truth that is there. Now, the Bible has been translated into roughly 2,000 languages. Now, since I collected that statistic, it's probably gone up because it's not decreasing, it is increasing. That is the purpose of those doing Bible translations. It has changed countless lives. Only God knows how many lives have been changed for the better by the Bible. It has brought salvation, healing, all kinds of healing, physical, mental, spiritual, relationship healing. It has brought hope and joy and peace with God and a purpose for living for those who accept and follow the teachings of the Bible. It has been wisely said, the Bible will keep you from sin and sin will keep you from the Bible. And that's what will happen to your life if you let that happen. Mm -hmm. Our motto throughout this series, and you will hear it during each presentation, we're not trying to wear it out, we're trying to emphasize a point, and this is the motto. You can read it with me out loud. Ready? If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it disagrees with the Bible, it's not for me. Now, there may be someone here today who says, oh, I just came here, I was invited. I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure the Bible is what you say it is yet. That's okay. Keep coming. Keep studying. And very soon you'll be saying, yeah, that's true. If it's in the Bible, I believe it, because the Bible is revealed as truth. We need a foundation to build our lives upon. So the question is, what is the foundation of your faith? well, I don't know if I really have any faith, then you probably have no foundation either. And your life is wandering aimlessly as the clock is ticking towards the day of your demise. You have a purpose. 
You have a direction. You have a meaning for your existence. We discover that in the Bible. We need to build that foundation, something that doesn't change with social trends. They're always changing. Something that is not based on the ever-changing philosophies of men. All kinds of philosophies, all kinds of theories. The popular theory of evolution, when I was growing up, we were taught in school, this is scientific fact, that the dinosaurs were destroyed when a volcanic eruption occurred. Well, they changed that. Now the books say, no, the Earth was hit by an asteroid. And, that all, and then stick around. They'll probably change it in another few years. Changing, changing, changing all the time. I built my life on this thinking it was real. But now you're saying it's not. The Bible will never do that to you. It hasn't changed. It never will change. It doesn't need to be changed. Because it is God's word and God is perfect. In whom or in what do you trust? Now, we're going to spend a short time looking at some Bible facts and facts about the Bible. We do not have time for everything. And if we did everything, we probably wouldn't get to eat lunch. So I'm with you. Though the Bible is one book, one book, it's actually a library of truth, library of truth that contains 66 different books written by 44 different authors over a period of about 1,500 years. Now, is it possible that those 44 authors had a special committee meeting and said, let's put together a nice sounding book so we can deceive the masses of people throughout? They didn't never met each other, most of them. That's too long a time to be able to do that. And yet, all 66 books of the Bible are linked like a chain. They are strong. They will hold you even though the storms of life will blow. Only something divine can do that. There are 39 books in the Old Testament of the Bible. That, in fact, is most of the Bible, like three-fourths of the Bible. And their uh, sacred history of the world from creation up till 400 years before the time of Christ. Then there's the New Testament, 27 books. And that is from a record of from the birth of Christ and forward to the beginnings of the Christian movement and uh, so forth. The Bible continues uh, that record. It is God's plan, the plan of salvation for mankind. It contains Bible prophecy that has foretold very significant events in the history of the world, including our time. Our time? Yes, our time. Uh, we're not going to look at it, but 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, you can read about that. We will be learning more about these things with each presentation. This is an introduction. Each presentation, each message in this seminar series. So please do not miss any of them. It's just a week. Just a week. If you can put priority one to be here, you will be blessed. Not more facts about the Bible. Thousands of years before humans figured out how to fly, how to make rockets, and how to send men into space to orbit the Earth and photograph the planet, thousands of years before that, God's word said this. He hangs the Earth upon nothing. Do you see a hanger? It's an actual photograph, right? There's nothing there. We're in this dark vacuum, spinning around and revolving around the sun, year after year, day after day. Who is guiding the track of planet? Well, <clears throat> I was told in the uh, class that it's uh, gravity. Well, congratulations. That is a physical law which God created, God's hand. But how did the Bible know in the Old Testament that the earth is hung? upon nothing. No one had ever, you grew up seeing these pictures, many of you, right? You remember when some of these, I do, when the first pictures of Earth from outer space were sent by the, wow, look at that. And here we are, this blue and green and brown and white ball spinning around in space and life is only here that we know of. 
There's life in heaven also, but none of us have been there. Another thing the Bible said, thousands of years behead, ahead of scientific discovery, is that the earth is round. Mm -hmm. We know that now. People didn't always know that, is what the Bible said. It is he, God, that sits upon the circle of the earth. Mm -hmm. How in the world would someone know that, to be inspired to write that, unless it came from God who knows and sees and has created all things? We jump ahead, a little bit from medical science. Did you know that uh, up until the beginning part of the last century, maybe even in a few backward countries today, the practice of bleeding people, you heard me right, bleeding people, cutting and releasing blood from the human body, was practiced for up till about 120 years ago. It was believed that, among other things, if you had a fever, whoa, your temperature is hot, you're burning up, there's something wrong, you have too much blood. That's what was believed. Medical science of the day. Doctors not only taught that, but believed that and practiced that. And guess what? When they would cut and release some of the blood, the temperature would go down for a little while until the body had a chance to rebound and say, whew, what was that? I got lightheaded on that. And mm, the temperature came back. Very interesting. Yet in the book of Leviticus, we find these words, life, the life of the flesh is in the blood. How did the book of Leviticus, written more than 3,000 plus years ago, know that? Unless, and we read that and say, oh yeah, that's a uh, atarimai in Japanese. Yeah, anybody knows that. This is thousands of years before science figured that out. You all know him, right? I mean, you've seen his picture. First president of the United States, George Washington. If you have some American money in your pocket, some of it has his picture on it. George Washington one day went out to check his property. It was a very cold day, rainy, he got wet, and he caught a bad fever. And it seemed he was getting worse, so they called in the best doctors they could find. I mean, this is a former president, best doctors they could find. And they said, yep, he has too much blood, so they bled him. And the temperature came down, right? Ooh, fever, looking pretty good. An hour or two later, right back up again. Hmm, still too much blood, so they bled him again. Temperature went down. A couple hours later, mm, came. still too much blood. You know, George Washington died from being bled to death. If they had known the fact, the truth of what the Bible teaches, they would have known, don't get rid of blood. He needs it right now. And maybe he could have lived a little longer. That's a very sad story, but it's true. Next one. The Bible contains many prophecies, accurate prophecies. The prophecies of the Bible have uh, always been 100% accurate. There are scores of prophecies, for example, in the Bible regarding the coming of the Savior, Jesus Christ. How do we know Jesus Christ was the Savior? There are some people who don't, they don't believe that. They don't, they're still looking for a Messiah. And there are others who think that's hogwash, the whole thing. How do we know that? Because the things that happened in his life, beginning with his birth, his ministry, his betrayal, the exact amount of money that he would be betrayed for, and by one who was in the inner circle of friends, of the disciples, it's all written there, prophesied hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ came to this world to become one of us. No human ability could do such a thing. Only God, in his infinite wisdom and knowledge, could reveal the future and then guide human events, guide human events to meet that. The Bible is God's word. Therefore, the Bible can be trusted. Do you trust it this morning? Oh, I just got here. I don't know yet. Well, stay with us. This afternoon, we're going to study an amazing, amazing Bible prophecy that further illustrates this truth. And this prophecy is not just one blip, but
but it is a prophecy, a prophecy that God, I believe, purposely put there because it spans thousands of years of time and covers many nations and empires and many other things. The amazing accuracy of this prophecy only could be by God. And now, you know, around here, the other day I was walking and I realized they still have those people here. There was a sign, palm reading. You know, people who go and pay money to have somebody look at the creases on your hand that are only there so you can close your fingers. See them bend? Mm -hmm. They want to find some meaning in there. Mm. Well, mine says M. That means Mark, right? That was there before my mother named me. Come on. And people, oh, you have a very long lifeline, somebody told me once. And I said, thank you very much. I'm going to live for eternity because I've accepted Jesus Christ. What? What are you talking? People pay money to do that stuff, hoping maybe there's some truth unless it's, unless it's bad news. Ooh, I see something terrible is going to happen to you in, a two, in two weeks. What? What? I don't know. Would you pay money for somebody to do that to you and then die from a heart attack of the stress? I don't think so. Trusting God's word, only he knows what the future holds. For example, did you know that uh, the Bible has a strong impact on human history? Your history, my history. What are you talking about? This is just a, over. I, I hope you can catch what I'm trying to say here. Without the Bible, no Bible, no Christianity, no Judaism, nothing. There could never have been classical music. Think of it. Some of you like classical music. Hey, I don't like that. Stuff. Well, there could never have been classical music. A lot of the tunes that we, that we know that are so famous worldwide that even non-Christians sing, and we'll be singing in a couple of months, hallelujah, it's inspired by the Bible. Wouldn't be there. Blank slate. Can you imagine? People would probably still be playing rock music with rocks, you know, banging rocks together. That's about it. There would, much of the art of the Western world would never have been created without the Bible. The United States of America, now you may not like the country, you may love the, I don't know, but just think about this. The United States of America, that, that God prophesied would one day arise in an area with very few people and become an escape pod for those under persecution in Europe to escape to and have the freedom of thought and a government that allows you to pursue your ideas and your dreams and your vision and your creativity. Therefore, automobiles and jets and uh, what else? On and on, the computers, IBM, Google, <laughs> Apple, all of this stuff. Why? Because there is a freedom. Somebody's not breathing over your shoulder. Don't do that. Don't think that. You've got to get approval from the big boss. Uh, do it. None of that would exist without the Bible. Freedom itself as we know it. Liberty would not exist because that whole idea, that whole concept comes from a Judeo-Christian foundation. No Bible? None of that. Very interesting. The scriptures show us that God is indeed in charge. But how are they written? And this is what the Bible says about itself. All scripture. How much scripture? How much is all? You know, some folks say, well, the Bible's nice, but there's part. I don't like the Old Testament. You know, God over there doing all those. Th I don't like that. I like Jesus is cool. I like him, you know. You can't pick and choose. It's a package deal. It's one book that's like going through the Bible. I don't like that part. <laughs> and some religions actually do that. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Not some guys that got together and said, let's write a book by God. And because that is true, it is profitable for doctrine, which means teaching that you can trust, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God, the woman, the person of God, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Wouldn't you like to see more good works in our world? Have you had enough of the bad works? Las Vegas, 
you know. Uh, fires in Northern California, murders in Tokyo, you know, over here, caught all of this stuff. Eh, or do you just think, oh, well, as long as it doesn't come near me. Hmm. The world we live in is abnormal, and the Bible tells us why. But all Scripture is given by inspiration. The light of truth is revealed in the Bible. It enlightens hearts, societies, and nations. And so the inspired writer wrote, Your word, God, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. What does that mean? You take away the word, you take away the light, what's left? Darkness. You know that happened in history? For hundreds of years, there was a period of time in Europe, quote, unquote, Christian Europe, where the Bible was removed from the people, from their eyes, from their ears, from their practice, and what was left, what you call the Dark Ages. Superstition ran supreme. Politics controlling religion and religion controlling politics because the Word of God was relegated to a dungeon, a library someplace covered with dust, and they followed human traditions instead. Thousands of years, it didn't work. Then came the Reformation. This month, 500 years ago, Martin Luther, you've heard of him, right? When God's word was rediscovered, the Reformation happened. Protestant movement, advanced mission work, Bible translation, all of these things. Get the word out there. Why? Because God's word is a lamp and a light, and without it, people are walking in darkness. That's what the scriptures are. Next scripture. God cannot lie. That is his character. That is his nature. Therefore, the Bible is true. Cannot lie. God inspired the Bible. And what is the purpose? We read it for scripture reading. Sanctify them, change and mold their hearts from unrighteousness to righteousness by your truth. Oh, which truth is that? Your word is truth. And there's only one word that is truth, all truth, from beginning to end, and that is God's word, the Bible. Next scripture. How much of the Bible is truth? The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Notice that God's judgments, his justice, is righteous. It's a foundation. It's always a standard of righteousness. And I, I never understood living in the States uh, this idea of a criminal person commits a crime, they are caught, the evidence is clear, the witnesses are there, and they're as guilty as sin itself, and they should receive the penalty. But if they talk with a lawyer and between lawyers and do what is called a plea bargaining, well, I'll admit that I'm guilty to save the court some time and money, and then I'll get a lighter sentence or maybe even go free. I've never understood that. Because in the Bible, it says the wages of sin is death. There's only one way out through Jesus Christ and the gift of salvation. Is there a pleading going on right now? Yes, we are told by Christ himself on our behalf, our intercessor in heaven, in the presence of God. New life begins for every person who accepts God's words, the scriptures. We have to, and I don't mean just, yeah, I believe the Bible is true. That's good. I keep one on my nightstand next to my bed, and I keep it dusted, and I don't put anything else on top of it because that's a holy book, and, and I know that's a holy book. Have you ever opened it up? Oh, open it. Ah, oh, no, not yet. Does you no good. All it is is a cardboard, paper, ink, and maybe some animal skin. Does you no good. You've got to go in, open it up, and let it shine forth, penetrate through the eyeballs and, and the nerves into the mind, into the heart, to the frontal lobes, where our ability to contemplate right and wrong and righteousness and eternity is then shocked into an alert awareness of our great need of what God offers to us. New life begins for those who study the Bible. The scriptures are spiritual nourishment, right? Maybe you ate breakfast this morning 
Maybe you didn't, but maybe you're going to eat lunch or dinner. You have to eat food. You need nourishment so all the nutrients can nourish your body and you can see and hear and walk and think, right? It's the same spiritually and morally. And it says, your words were found and I ate them. What does that mean? I put them in. I internalize. I put them into practice. When you eat food, do you swallow it whole? Oh, look, an apple. <coughs> Choke to death, right? What do you have to do? You have to smash it down. You have to break it down into smaller portions. Mingle it with saliva. Sorry, I don't mean to be gross, but that's what happens when we eat. Mingle it with saliva and then swallow it down so it can be digested and absorbed. The difference with God's word is we don't swallow it down. We swallow it up, right up into here. So it can become a part of us. Without the scriptures... We have no truth, maybe a semblance of truth, a few grains here and there, but there's no connection. It doesn't make any sense. No hope, no faith, no direction, no purpose in life, no identity. Who are you? Who am I? I don't know who I am. I'm trying to discover myself. Have you heard those phrases, you know, in the... Hey, I, I really know. Who are you? I've been living with you for 30 years. I don't know you. It is. Why not? You have no context for knowing. The foundation, the, the, the center pole from which everything then begins to make sense, that is the word of God. The only rule of faith and practice for the Christian is God's word, though all Christians do not make it their only rule and practice. The Protestant reformers always said, Scripture alone, the Bible alone. Why? They lived in a time when so many people followed tradition and a little bit of Bible just to season it. What happened? The Dark Ages. And when they saw the light of God's word, they said, we're coming out of that. We don't want to go back. We don't want to stay there. And they moved forward one step at a time, one restored doctrine, one restored truth at the time. The Bible must be our study and our guide in life. You can have it and not study it. does you no good. You can have it and study it and not practice it. It's still not doing you any good. You can have it and study it and practice it and live by it. That is when life begins, when direction is changed. And we don't mean from time to time when the weather is clear. Every day, in the light, in the dark, Things are good, things are bad. It's kind of like the promise that people make when they're in love, in front of a preacher, in front of all the church full of witnesses. Do you promise to love, honor, cherish, and obey in sickness and in health, in prosperity and adversity, so long as you both shall live and keep each other only? And they always, every wedding I've done, they've always said yes. Some of them a few years later say, what have I done? Uh, which is unfortunate. We need to be very clear before making that kind of decision. The Bible is God's word. One writer, an inspired writer, put it this way. We should come with reverence. With what? With reverence to the study of the Bible. I put the Japanese there for a few that may not quite get this. Feeling that we are in the presence of God all lightness and trifling should be laid aside. While some portions of the word are easily understood, the true meaning of other parts is not so readily discerned. You've got to spend some time there. You've got to think about that. You've got to dig. You may have to go back for several days. There must be patient study and meditation. This is the only true, safe, profitable meditation. Not all of that garbage that tells you empty your mind. You know, just empty your brain, think of nothing. And when you think of nothing, what does that make you? Anyway, moving right along. Meditation and earnest prayer. Earnest prayer. Every student, as he opens the scriptures, who is the student? Anyone who's studying the Bible. I'm a student, what does that mean? I come to learn. Not to tell the Bible, well, I think you're wrong here. But this is what I think, so therefore I reject that. That's not a student. That's a rebel. A student must patiently study and meditate. Every student, as he opens the scriptures, should ask for the enlightenment 
of the Holy Spirit. And the promise is sure that it will be given. God has not given us his word so that he can leave us with a blank mind. I don't understand this. What's the Bible for? I read it and I didn't understand it. How many people have said that? Well, study is a little bit deeper than reading and seeing the context. Another way you never study the Bible, you, you know, on a regular basis is, okay, God, what do you have for me today? Don't do that. Don't do that. You might put your finger on something you wish you hadn't because it's out of context. Page by page, line by line, scripture by scripture. And none of us have any excuse. There are so many Bibles now, study Bibles that have the, the related scriptures listed for you to check out. Very good. Finally, the Bible foretold a time, a very dangerous time, when, uh, well, let's, let's, let's read what one writer wrote. The world is perishing for want of or lack of the gospel. There is a famine for the word of God. The best-selling book, translated into more languages than any other book in history, distributed to more millions and billions of people than any book in history, and yet the world is in a famine condition? One that will get even more severe in the days and years ahead? Why is that? Why is that? Keep coming to the meetings, and I think you will discover some of these answers. The Bible foretold, prophesied, that error and heresies would proliferate throughout history, right up until the return of Jesus Christ, which is also, by the way, the end of history, of this world. Here's one example text. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables, created stories, fairy tales, nursery rhyme type stuff, and not the word of God. Do you see a little bit now why there is a famine for the word of God? People dying of spiritual malnutrition when it is available, right there. There's a story that is told, true story. Years ago, it happened in mainland China. A terrible drought and a famine that resulted. The time was agrarian, right? And you can't just ship stuff in from another part of the world. And pe people were dying every day by the hundreds, by the thousands. Little children crying at night, I'm hungry, and the parents couldn't feed them. And then someone discovered that there was a type of soil a, a dirt that would do you no harm because it was pretty clean dirt. There wasn't a lot of uh, microorganisms in there that would, that would mess you up. And so they began to mix this dirt with water and warm it up and feed it to their children and to themselves. And they could go to bed at night with a full stomach and sleep without the gnawing pangs of hunger. But you know what? Their stomachs were full, but they were dying anyway, just prolonging the death. It was inevitable. There's no nourishment in dirt, but there is nourishment in the living bread of God's Word. And that's what we want to study here this week together. Finally, the best protection against deception and a wasted life for every person has always been the unadulterated, what does that mean? Untwisted, unchanged, unflip-flopped word of God. Study it, believe it, obey it, and live by it. And it is guaranteed by God himself, you will be blessed. Does that mean all your troubles in life will be removed? No, because we live in an abnormal world. Till the Lord comes, we've got to get used to that. But he gives us a whole new way to endure and to conquer and to overcome and to be at peace.